picture. This is from some of my research over 10 years ago in Antarctica. What I like about it is that there's uh, some, some of this frozen water and this liquid water, and you can see how this bright surface will reflect more than 90% of the sunlight back into space, and this will absorb more than 90% of the sunlight and, and cause the water to heat up. And so uh, as this melts, there's uh, more heat absorbed, more sunlight absorbed as heat at the Earth's surface. So I'm going to start off by talking, most of my talk is just, I'm going to talk for 20 minutes about the science of climate change, and then Jim is going to take over and talk about what are some of the oil companies responding to this global challenge. And so uh, just to start off, what is climate? So if we have a really hot summer, a drought, that doesn't mean that the Earth's climate is changing. It means we had a hot summer. Uh, climate weather is what's happening today. Today got in the 80s. Yesterday was 79. But if tomorrow it was a cold front came through and it was in the 40s or 30s, that, does, that just means that a cold front came through. If, if the polar jet comes down, that's normal variation in the weather. It's not until the, you can say the 30-year average of the temperature, the 30-year average of the rainfall has changed, can we start talking about whether the climate has changed. And if we want to look at the climate, let's look at the past. We all know that the Earth's climate has been changing throughout Earth's history. I'm just going to go back 300 million years, and the reason is, is because 300 million years ago, down here, the Earth's climate was similar to today. Uh, over this 30, 300 million years, around 100 million years ago, this is a cartoon, but it's, it's fairly accurate. We're looking at the Cretaceous. We're looking at global temperatures are more than 10 degrees warmer than the present. The, there's no ice anywhere on the planet. There's forests growing in Antarctica. There's palm trees in Sweden. There's dinosaurs roaming the Earth. And there's no humans. And why was the Earth's climate so much warmer 100 million years ago? This is a lot more CO2 on the planet. It was probably over 1,000, maybe 1,200 parts per million. And why was there more CO2? Because of plate tectonics. There's more volcanic activity. And the volcanic activity over the last 100 years has decreased, and there's less CO2 coming from volcanoes into the atmosphere. If we want to zoom in here on just the last three million years, we, we look at a, a different period of history where now we're talking about orbital forcing of the Earth's climate. By orbital, I mean changes in the Earth's orbit, changes in the Earth's tilt. This is also a cartoon, but you see around 300 million years ago, we started having mini ice ages every 41,000 years. And then around a million years ago, we started having a major ice age approximately every 100,000 years. What was causing the Earth's climate to change? It wasn't changes in CO2. It was changes in the Earth's tilt. There's a 41,000 year cycle in the Earth's tilt. And when you have less tilt, you have colder summers. When you have colder summers, snow is allowed to accumulate over time. And you can gradually uh, get a mini ice age. And then you, you come out of that. And then around 100,000, there's also a 23,000 year cycle in the Earth's wobble. Uh, but we, we got to a point, there's a gradual cooling over this period. And we get to a point where we get to a major ice age. And uh, I'll show you the real data that come, came from the bottom of the oceans, the Earth's sediments. The uh, ocean drilling program provided this wonderful data set of the Earth's climate over the last three million years. You, you all know that it's hard to find uh, ocean crust greater than 140, 150 million years or so. And so we, we have fossil records to help us piece together what was happening back further in time. But if we zoom in here on the last 50,000 years, now we see we're, we're in the middle of the ice age. And then around 20,000 years, we come out of the ice age. And uh, for the last 20,000 years, we've had a nice interglacial, a nice warm period. Uh, all of human civilization started here. We had the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. We had Mesopotamia. We had division of labor. Agriculture, all happening in this nice warm climate. Now, Homo sapiens evolved right around here, around 120, 150,000 years ago. 
did uh, Homo sapiens evolve? And essentially between here and here, over this whole ice age, they were hunters and gatherers. And it wasn't until we had a nice, stable, warm climate that human civilization was able to go beyond the hunter and gatherer stage and start uh, agriculture and building cities and doing other things besides worrying about how to get food. And if we want to look at the last thousand years, now you can see we have the medieval warm period, we have the little ice age here starting about 1400, and then the last hundred years the warming that all, uh, all the excitement is about, all the recent excitement is about. So I'm going to talk about the physics of climate change, what, uh, uh, wh where the evidence is to, ex how, how can we explain this past climate? And so here is some data. We're looking at benthic foraminifera. We're looking at the oxygen isotope, the, the oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 isotope ratio. And uh, they've translated that into some kind of temperature. This is from Antarctic, I mean, um, Sorry, this is from the bottom of the ocean. And so this is about five million years ago, and then right around three million years ago, we crossed the threshold, and now we're having this mini ice age on this 41,000. So here's the real data, not the cartoon. And then you see these major ice ages and these interglacials. And um, we've got data from all around the world. You can look at whether the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere had different climates, and when did we have these global climate instead of these regional climate events. Uh, this, this, by the way, is run out of Texas A&M. It's a bit highly successful, uh, thousands of sediment cores from all around the world's oceans. If we, uh, this is a place I've spent a lot of time, is in the, the summit of the Greenland ice sheet, but they're also have done, the Russians and the Europeans have done lots of ice cores in Antarctica. So the ice here is two miles deep. And uh, it snows a lot more in Greenland than it does in Antarctica because it's not as cold. The warm air can hold more water. So uh, the ice here, you go to the bottom and you get to bedrock, is about 180, almost 200,000 years old. In Antarctica, it's almost a million year old ice. And these, these cores are about, uh, I don't know, about three meters in length. And Here's a close-up of a piece of Antarctic ice, and you can see there's little bubbles trapped in it. So from those bubbles, you can look at how much CO2, how much methane, how much greenhouse gases were in the ice. And you can look at the ratio of oxygen isotopes and hydrogen isotopes and try and say something about what the temperature was like. And when you do that, you can see that uh, 400,000 years ago in Antarctica, uh, it was a lot warmer. Uh, there's a lot more CO2, uh, 280 parts per million. And then there's this gradual global cooling, uh, rapid warming, gradual global cooling, rapid warming, gra global cooling, gra rapid warming, brief, brief interglacials, long ice ages. And then here's the last 200, I mean 20,000 years. <clears throat> These ice ages were caused by changes in the Earth's orbit, not by... <laughs> changes in CO2. Once uh, the oceans cooled down, then CO2 is more soluble in cold water, and CO2 did decrease. And it, it acted as a positive feedback. It amplified the cooling. And then we had a, a rapid warming, and then CO2 responded to that and came out of the oceans and back into the atmospheres, and again, acted as a positive feedback. When it's colder, it's drier, and it's dustier. So this is looking at dust in the ice cores. But, so this is all well understood. This, clearly establishes that uh, over the last, and this, now this record goes back 800,000 years, but it shows that during an interglacial warm period, there's about 280 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And during an ice age, it's something like 190 parts per million. So before we get any further, I just want to show what has been known for over 100 years, that uh, CO2 tracks heat. And so, and the reason they call it the greenhouse effect is because sunlight, visible light, is not absorbed by greenhouse gases. And so, you get about uh, 340 watts per meter squared on average coming from the sun, and about 100 watts per meter squared is reflected back into space 
from clouds and from snow and from the Earth's surface. But about 238, this is globally average, uh, watts per meter squared comes into, uh, it is uh, absorbed by the Earth's surface. And so this is, uh, if uh, the Earth's not changing temperature, then we're in, we're in equilibrium, the climate's in equilibrium, and 238 watts per meter squared is leaving the Earth's atmosphere going back into outer space. So we're in equilibrium temperature. This is uh, close to the current situation. The, uh, what's really surprising is, is that CO2 is a very strong, it's not just CO2, it's, there's other greenhouse gases, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, there's, there's several of them. CO2 is the, the main player here. It absorbs almost 100% of the heat that's emitted by the Earth's surface. So this is visible sunlight, not heat. So this is one of those questions on the final exam for my climate change students. True, false. The Earth's atmosphere is heated by the sun, and it's false. The sunlight isn't really absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. It's absorbed by the Earth's surface, and it heats up the Earth, and the Earth radiates heat back into space. And so the CO2 is acting like a blanket. And in this simple back-of-the-envelope calculation I'm going to show for you today, it's, I'm going to assume it's absorbing 100%. It's closer to 95%, but the math's a lot easier when you just use 100%. So, the CO2 absorbs 100% of the heat escaping from the Earth, and it radiates it back in all directions, randomly. Uh, and so for this, half of it's going back into space, half of it's going back down to Earth. This is the greenhouse effect. This is the extra heating from the Earth's atmosphere. And if the Earth did not, okay, so we can, so what, what does that mean? How much energy is actually coming from the Earth so that we get 238 watts going back into watts per meter squared? We need the sum of these two, 476, to actually, so if there was no atmosphere, we had 238 coming out in and 238 going back into space. And the Earth would be 32 degrees colder. Right now, the average Earth temperature is about 16 degrees Celsius. So we'd be a frozen planet late today. It would be minus 16 degrees. So the greenhouse effect is a good thing. It's, uh, it's kept the Earth from, it's made the Earth a habitable place. Mars is a frozen planet because it doesn't have enough atmosphere. And Venus is a runaway greenhouse because it's 96% CO2 and its ocean has boiled away. And so we're, we're the Goldilocks. We're, we're the happy medium. We've got a, a, a nice, stable climate uh, and this, this atmosphere that absorbs almost all of the heat going into space and then re-radiates it is keeping us uh, where we're not too hot and we're not too cold. If we were to double the amount of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. Uh, so this, this, this temperature is too high. It should be, about two, should be about 10 degrees colder, 11 degrees colder. But it's because I made some big assumptions. Um, but if we added a second atmosphere, you can see that still this assumption that we're at equilibrium means that the amount of heat coming in equals the amount of heat going out. But now we've got an extra layer of atmosphere where if we've got 476 watts leaving this layer, we need 476 watts entering that layer, which means we have an enhanced greenhouse effect with 476 watts coming back down to the Earth's surface. So now you can see the more CO2 you add to the atmosphere, the thicker the blanket, and the more heat that's going to come back from the atmosphere and warm up the planet. All right, so this is way wrong, way, way, way too much warming. But you get the idea. The more CO2 you add, the more heat is going to be trapped. Nobody disputes this. This is just simple physics. It's been known for over 100 years. So <clears throat> how much CO2 is in the atmosphere today? <clears throat> We're right around 400 parts per million. If we go back to pre-industrial times, if we go back 250 years, it's going to be down to 280 parts per million. When I graduated from high school and, and was a freshman in college and first learned about this, there was about 340. And then I went to uh, graduate school and uh, it was around 350. And then I went to Colorado and was a postdoc and, and 
had, uh, did traveling all around the world, studying the atmosphere. It was around 370. And then I started at the University of Houston, it was 380. So I've been teaching about this for over 10 years. And it's gone from 380 to 400. So it's going about two parts per million per year. You, you, if you look at this closely, you can see recessions. You can see all kinds of changes in, in um, both the sources and the, and the removal processes of CO2 from the atmosphere. Why has it gone up? Some of it has gone up from cutting down trees. And some of it's gone up because of us burning fossil fuels. And we have very precise records of, you can see back in 1850, it's all due to coal. You can't even see the green line because it's the same as the black line. And then around 1900, now we start to see petroleum becoming important. Then in the 1950s, now natural gas is becoming uh, important as a source. We have very precise records of how much um, coal and oil and gas that we're burning. Uh, and you can even see, see, even see us building the federal highway system here and then cement production. When you heat up the cement, the calcium carbonate uh, gives off CO2 during the, the kilns uh, needed to make cement. So um, you can look at the carbon isotopes of the CO2 in the atmosphere and see that it's getting older uh, because we're using fossil carbon. So here's uh, one way of looking at the temperature record. And we're looking at the temperature change. So if you look at 1900 to 2000, uh, this is this is the deviation from the average. And the reason I'm showing this is you can clearly see uh, when there's a major volcanic eruption, here's Mount Pinatubo, you put a lot of sulfur into the atmosphere, especially if it's a, a volcanic eruption in the tropics. Uh, the, uh, it can be, have a global impact because it gets spread both to the northern and southern hemispheres. Uh, you can see two cold years. Uh, El Chichon went off, but then we had a, a major El Nino right after that. So El Nino is a change in the ocean circulation off the coast of Peru. It's, it's when you stop upwelling from happening. The, the cold, deep water uh, coming up off the coast of Peru is nutrient rich, and it's great for fishing. It's great for the anchovies off the coast of Peru. And when the, the winds, the trade winds die down and are weakened, that hot water builds up there and stops the upwelling and you get an extra warm uh, year. And so you can see some of the major El Ninos here were, uh, and 1998 stands out as a, quite a warm, a really strong El Nino. So there's lots of noise in this signal. Uh, there's, there's a trend, but uh, there's things happening. Uh, I, there's gonna be another mo vol major volcanic eruption. It's been a, quite a while since we've had one. It's gonna cause a couple years of global cooling. Those particles stay in the upper atmosphere stratosphere for about two years. If you look at uh, that same temperature record, you can see here's the CO2 record, and here's uh, the, the global average temperature. This is the temperature of the land surface and the ocean surface. But uh, one thing to remember is, is most of the Earth is covered by water. And uh, when you heat up the land, you're just heating up the top inch or so. When you heat up the ocean, it mixes to, to a depth of at least two kilometers. And so that, and water's got a much larger heat capacity than soil does. That's why my grandparents had a, a root cellar where they stored their preserves in their basement, right? Because that temperature didn't change so much, even though uh, the summers in Ohio could get kind of hot sometimes, and the winters could get kind of cold. Uh, this is looking at that same data. Uh, I guess one of the points in that data is you see that there's times when uh, temperature's not changing very much. There's times when it's actually showing cooling and warming and cooling again. Uh, yeah, here's a warming and here's a cooling. So, but if you, climate's really the 30-year average, but if we even just look at the 10-year average, now you see, um, there's uh, th these colder years, these intermediate years, and then this is the 80s, the 90s, and then here's the, the first decade of the new century. Um, that uh, the temperature is clearly going up faster than it was 
um, 40 years ago or longer. But really, the 500-pound the gorilla in the Earth's climate system is the oceans. Some of the reasons for this noise over here has to do with ocean circulation. Ocean's much better at storing heat. And when you trap heat and re-radiate it down, it's really the heat, not the temperature, that's important. And even though the ocean temperature hasn't increased very much, it's very good at storing heat. So you look at the last 10 years or more, and you see even though the the air temperature may have leveled off a little bit. The ocean heat storage is continuing to rise. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, it, it's unfortunate we only have about 50 years of data from the ocean. These are buoys that have thermometers that are going down two kilometers. And so there's an array of them. And we didn't have very many of them back here, but we have a lot more data today. Satellites have been wonderful because it gives a global temperature of the surface temperature, but they're not telling us what's happening deep in the ocean, which is where a lot of that heat is being stored. But you can see that uh, there really hasn't been a pause in the warming when you look at the total Earth system. And it turns out that if you look at the land temperatures versus how much heat is stored in the land versus the ocean, 90% of the heat is stored in the water, and a little tiny bit is stored on land. So. If you want to know whether the climate is changing or not, you want to look in the oceans, uh, not on the land temperatures. So I just told you about surface temperature and ocean temperature, but there's other indicators that the Earth's climate is warming. Uh, there's warmer air holds more water. There's more water in the atmosphere. Uh, sea surface temperatures have gone up. There's sea ice is melting. I told you about this one, the ocean heat content. If you heat up the ocean, uh, water expands. So over half of the sea level rise is due to thermal expansion. And then the other part is due to melting of the glaciers, particularly the big ice sheets. So Antarctica and Greenland melting is part of the other half. Uh, and there's less snow cover. So we have great satellite data. We have great data over the last 30 years or more showing less snow and ice on the planet, uh, melting of the ice sheets, and the surface temperatures, we, we still need a little, we're, we're still, the ocean is the big 500 pound gorilla, and it'd be great if we had a better understanding of what was happening with oceans and ocean circulation. So when you look at climate change, the big question is which, which of these, what about all the natural forcings? The climate has changed due to natural causes. The sun is not constant. The, uh, we know that volcanoes emit CO2. Well, it turns out volcanoes are 100 times less. The total amount of CO2 coming from volcanoes is 100 times less than the CO2 coming from humans burning oil and gas and coal. You can look at all the natural causes of climate change, and none of them explain what is happening. In fact, most of the natural causes of climate change are very slow, happening over thousands or millions of years. And so the question is, which one of these, you know, is there a natural warming and the greenhouse effect is a small amount? Is it, are we really having natural cooling? And I, I would probably say this is the most likely of these, that yes, there is some natural causes of climate change, but they're very slow. And that most of what you see, or all of what you see, is due to human activities. This is a forecast of uh, 2070 to 2100, and this is, uh, I call this an extreme forecast. This is if we do nothing. If we just continue business as usual, and you can see um, the land is warming up more than the oceans. The, uh, the Arctic is warming up faster than everyone else, and this is continuing the trends we've seen already. Um, and um, this doesn't sound, I mean, what is the, what's the big deal? Uh, if Texas gets hotter, we'll just turn up our air conditioners. And the big deal is not the temperature. The big deal for me is the water. We all saw what 2011 was like. But if you, um, if it turns out that food, the, the corn and rice and soybeans and uh, wheat grows that doesn't grow as well when it's hot. There's a, so maybe we can do something about it. Maybe we can 
genetically engineer our crops to grow better when it's warmer. But if you look at the climate models, they forecast that West Texas is going to get hotter and drier. Um, and that's going to be a big challenge for all the ranching, the ranchers in the state. I, I don't know if any of you remember the 1950s, but there was a massive drought and a lot of the ranching left Texas. Uh, I predict if we don't do anything 50 years from now, we're not going to have ranching in Texas at all. It's just they're not going to be able to grow enough uh, grass and hay for the, for the cows, the cattle to eat. But you can see uh, different amounts of warming. We're, we're already about 0.8 degrees of warming. So uh, politically and somewhat arbitrarily, politicians have decided two degrees is what we want to avoid. We want to stop at two degrees. And I'm not a politician. I'm a scientist. I'm just trying to show you what the, what, uh, what the consequences are. But certainly, the warmer it gets, the more impact there's going to be on our food. But water is even more important. I mean, if you don't have any water, you can't <laughs> irrigate your crops. And so, the, uh, fortunately, in Texas, we don't rely on glaciers as our water source. In the western United States, they do. And they're going to be in trouble. But there's going to be um, decreases in water availability. Now, if you heat up the oceans, you have more evaporations, you're accelerating the hydrologic cycle, there's going to be more rain. The problem is, is it turns out the general rule is the wet places are going to get wetter and the dry places are going to get drier. So Las Vegas, Phoenix, Central Valley, California, they're going to be bigger, big challenges. Now, I don't think that it's going to be the end of humanity, the end of the United States. We're a wealthy nation. We can adapt to a lot of these. And uh, the, the, the real, there's, there's two options. One is, you know, we can build a higher seawall for Galveston and, and the refineries because they're going to get flooded. They're going to, uh, major hurricanes are going to cause more damage there. I'm not saying there's going to be more hurricanes, but when we have one, sea level, sea level rise is going to be more um, potentially damaging. And then there's mitigation. Mitigation is basically slowing down this big experiment. If we know this is going to happen, maybe by putting less CO2 in the atmosphere, we can slow this experiment down. Just from a conservative point of view, we can uh, not see how warm can we get it, how bad can we get it, we can, we can mitigate that some. There is going to be, uh, coral reefs are pretty much, um, the warmer temperatures are, are causing coral reefs to disappear, but it's also CO2 dissolves in the oceans and causes the oceans to acidify. And this is happening already. Uh, most of the ocean scientists I talked to said this is unavoidable because we're, we're going to get to two degrees of warming and, and, this, and the coral reefs are really going to have a, a, a real hard time. Uh, but there, there's going to be, and there's other reasons for extinction. The coral reefs are also getting pollution. Uh, once you get their immune system weakened because of pollution and warmer temperatures, then they're more susceptible to viruses and other things that travel through the atmosphere. But, the warming is a, is a big factor. And then um, potentially more extreme weather events. So there, this sort of climate change common ground is that all the client scientists that I talk to and some of the ones that disagree with me all agree that the, the total heat content of the, ocean, of the Earth system, the ocean and the, and the land, has increased over the past 50 years. This is just based on direct measurements. There's no modeling. Uh, and the concentrations of these greenhouse gases have increased in the atmosphere due to human activities. And uh, 0.1 and 0.2 are related. We know that more greenhouse gases were trapping more heat. And so, and there's going to be some significant negative impacts to our environment and society. And part of this is, is our society has evolved to a point where we're globally interdependent. The, the manufacturing sector is this just in time. We all know how a snowstorm or a tsunami can have significant economic indicators. Well, I'm telling you that if there's flooding due to sea level rise, or if there's uh, agricultural, if there's a water shortage, this is going to have significant economic impacts. That the drought of 2011 cost the state of Texas over 10 billion dollars, and so. That, was, that type of weather is going to become more common in the future because 
we're changing the climate. Open up the floor to questions. Uh, anybody want to ask some questions? And that there's going to be some negative impacts. And there's going to be some benefits as well, but overall it's going to be a net negative for the planet. The, you're correct. Uh, it's cold is not good for crops, but it's not getting colder, it's getting warmer. Well, okay, I will contradict you there. This is a chart from uh, Hadcrook with Hadley and Climate Research Group out of England for the last 17 to 18 years, and it shows slight yeah. cooling. Uh, these, are the, these are the global right. warming people. That, 17 years is not a climate. 30 years yeah. is a climate. And if you look at my decades, you saw that the climate is still warming. And if you, you can go back 50 years and see a 10-year period where the climate is not warming. That is 100% consistent with everything I say. The, uh, you're also only looking at the air temperature. You're not looking at the ocean heat. No, and I clearly showed that the ocean heat is 90% of the warming. That's not true, and I just, just confirmed it on the internet. This is based everything on the not, ev not everything you read on the internet this is, is fact. This is their website. Not every website is fact. Their website. Their I'm part. not saying, I'm saying that <laughs> that data is correct, but that's not what climate is. Climate is not 17 years of data. And in fact, the Earth is warming up over the last 17 years, and if you look at the ocean, it's very clear. We're going to have to cut it off okay, for a minute yeah, and yeah. let other people ask questions. Um, I guess this okay. We have a little last age. Do you agree with that? I talked about it. <laughs> All right. Earth's been warming for 300 years. CO2 level did not start up until the Industrial Revolution where we could start measuring the increase in CO2. Oh, we can measure the increase in CO2 going back 800,000 years, right? Up and down and up and down. Correct. And up and down. Damn, Correct. And that was due, and that, see, CO2 is not the only way to change climate. The way you change climate is changing the amount of the energy budget, the energy coming in versus the energy coming out. Some of the climate change is due to changes in the strength of the sun. I clearly said the ice ages were caused by changes in the Earth's tilt, changes in the Earth's orbit, not CO2. Well, I'd like to interject something. Just one second. Why are you blaming the first 150 years of warming? On natural causes, and yet you're going to change. You're going to blame the last 150 years no. on carbon so dioxide. The, the, let me go back to my figure, if you may. At the last hundred years of warming, it's been warming since the end of the Little Ice Age. If we go right here, right, this is still a cooling trend, and then this well, is the warming. You're looking at a completely different curve than I am, which comes from a bunch of NASA. Uh, I am a NASA scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I get funding from NASA to do my research. Here's another, here's another going back 5.5 million years. You can clearly see the gradual cooling in the last 5.5 million years. Okay. So, Barry, can I make a comment? I think the pointer's over here. I have it in my pocket. So some of these things are related to the Milankovitch cycle, right? All of this is the Milankovitch cycle. This is 41,000 years. Milankovitch cycle? Okay. According, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but according to the Milankovitch cycle, we should be getting cooler. Is that correct? About three years ago, we turned cooler. The uh, very gradually, slowly cooler, according to the Milankovitch cycles. But there's other changes that have happened. The sun has gotten a little brighter over the last hundred years. That's why I said the natural causes are about zero over the last hundred. Hundred years is a very short time geologically. We're aware. Of I know. That's why this should not be a shock to you guys. Well, what you're replacing is, I thought you were following the news, that we've been getting some of our, on, on certain peak days, we've been getting 40% of our energy in Texas from, from wind power. I heard that as yeah, well. Yeah, that, 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 that has from That's from ERCOT. ERCOT reported. That's, that's a very extreme case. Right. But on a very windy case. day in the summer, we got a couple times, we got 40 well, I mentioned that the, the Koch brothers, and I had a slide from the, the front paper. Uh, Richard Mueller, who is a Berkeley environmental si uh, atmospheric scientist, he wrote an uh, op-ed for the Wall Street Journal, which is 
you know, one of those liberal rags that comes out of New York, uh, essentially said that uh, if you were skeptical about climate change, you had good reason, but now you don't. And essentially, it was a partly Koch Brothers funded study where they went back and looked at historical records since I think the 1700s. And the main driver, they looked at volcanics, they looked at sunspots, the main driver was CO2 emissions from burning carbon. And that's the Koch Brothers funded study. I'm going to ask this guy back here because I don't know him. Everybody else, I do. So there's, there's no silver bullet. There's not one thing we can do. Planting trees is helpful. It's certainly better than cutting them down. The trees don't live very long. And, and when they die, they, that CO2 goes back to the atmosphere. So it's not a, a long-term solution, but it helps on the short term. I, I think <coughs> oil companies know very well how to put CO2 into the ground. And I think if you can do it in an unpopulated region, it's a very good thing to do. Uh, it turns out NRG is going to take uh, the parish power plant in Sugarland, one, one of the boilers, and devote it to capturing the CO2, building a pipeline with the Japanese, and putting it into an old oil well about 80 miles away. Uh, I don't know why they're doing it, because there's not a price on carbon yet, but it's going to cost them about a billion dollars, and they're, they're moving forward with that project. Uh, having been on a sequestration project uh, and talked to other people, uh, I'm not sure it's really a cost-effective way of getting through, a, getting rid of a CO2. Except maybe like the, the Bureau of Economic Geology, they're looking at studies about putting it in into some of the offshore wells and state waters, so they can get a royalty for this, and they can also get, you know, more more production. But uh, and then as far as the trees, you know, when, when we were doing the CO2 sequestration, we had to guarantee that the CO2 would stay in the ground for a thousand years. And I don't know of any trees that hang around for a thousand years. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of nuclear power. That's great. Yeah. There were a whole bunch of people out there that were afraid to say it. And well, it's California, so. Even, <laughs> well, it, the, the Germans are scared of nuclear power and the Japanese, but. Um, yeah. yeah. Germans were not going to be hit by a tsunami. The French generate over 80% of their electricity from no. nuclear power. Well, if I, if I could add just a comment here. Uh, James Hansen, who I mentioned here a number of times, probably know the name, he's a big proponent for nuclear power. But one of the things about this carbon tax, it doesn't, and also James Hansen was a federal employee for many years, he doesn't want the federal government to get the money and make the decision. He wants, that's why he's for this revenue neutral carbon tax or cap, uh, fee and carbon fee and uh, dividend. He wants the American people to choose what they want to, you know, spend their money on for energy. And if they decide it's going to be nuclear, it's going to be nuclear. Or if it's going to be wind and solar, but they're going to, they're going to drive it. The South, so they're, you have a they're, on that? they're shrinking globally. I've been to Antarctica and to Greenland. Um, <coughs> the, there's, NASA has these wonderful satellites that are radar and they're measuring, they get a radar signal from the top of the ice and they get another one from the bedrock underneath. And so we have great data for the last 30 years of the melting of the polar ice caps, both in Antarctica and in Greenland. The, there, it turns out that as the air warms up, warm air holds more water. So you're gonna get more snow in the center of the ice sheets because right now it's so cold there's not much water that can, the, the air doesn't hold much water. So you will get more snow in the middle of the ice cap, but the edges are melting faster than the middle is getting more snow. So you, but you're here. diagnostic of, of climate change? That's, a, that's completely consistent with, with the idea that greenhouse gases are causing the warming. If the sun was getting brighter, the stratosphere would not be getting colder. The stratosphere is where the ozone layer is, there would be more UV and there would be more warming of the stratosphere. But because the Earth's surface is getting warmer and the stratosphere is getting colder, it's more evidence that it's the greenhouse gases that are causing the warming, not the 
not any potential brightening of the sun. Give Clint the last one, because it's getting past 8.30. I, I was trying to get everything wrapped up by 8.30. We can always hang around afterwards. Yeah, I'm happy to stay. Uh, Lindzen has retired, and his, his ideas haven't changed in 30 years, and he's completely discredited in the climate science community. No, it's not me. It's, it's, what was the last paper he published in a peer-reviewed journal? Uh, I, it was in my chart here, and I just mentioned how water vapor would cause more snow. But if we talk about the indicators, I, I, I want I only had 20 minutes. I understand. And, uh, <laughs> you warm up the air, and water vapor increases. So, all right, I, I'm happy to tell you about clouds having both a negative and a positive feedback. And the net effect is about, it turns out, the net effect of clouds is warming because they, at night, and here, again, nighttime temperatures are warming up faster than daytime temperatures. Clouds are made of water, water's a greenhouse gas. It's actually the most important greenhouse gas. Why are we talking about CO2 and not water? Water stays in the atmosphere for 10 days. CO2 stays in the atmosphere for 20 years, okay? That's why we could have a machine that pumped water in the atmosphere, you shut off the machine, 10 days later, all the water's back on the ground. That's why we talk about CO2. Why is there more water vapor in the atmosphere? Because there's more <coughs> CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 is warming the atmosphere, and then more water evaporates, and warmer air holds more water, and so there's more water in the atmosphere. So with flares... No, of course, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to talk about the sun. But the sun did have an extended down period in 2011 and 2012. Now it's on its way back up again. And the changes in the, in the total, that 238 watts per meter squared, between a, a down cycle and an up cycle is less than 1%. And uh, the sun 4.6 billion years ago was 27% dimmer. The faint, there was a faint early sun, and it's gotten brighter over the past 4.6 billion years. But there was a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere in the Earth's early atmosphere, which is why we've always had liquid water on this planet. The sun has been wet, very extremely well measured over the last 40 years, and the sun is not the cause of the recent warming. The sun does not explain the last 50 years of warming. And, and we can take this up afterwards, but I, I'm going to well, give you the last statement, James. I'll let you last. The first part of my talk was based on a paper that I wrote and it was peer reviewed. And if you have certain comments and theories, I suggest you write a paper, submit it for review. Regarding the other part, I was afraid about advocacy, but the revenue neutral climate tax is the easiest one to look at, and I thought the economic report which again was submitted to your congressman and your senators, you might want to know about it, gave some interesting economic responses that are kind of surprising. Because I don't even think the citizen climate lobby thought that the economy could actually improve with a revenue neutral climate tax. So if you didn't like to hear that, you know, I was the speaker, so thank you. Well, guys, I appreciate you coming. Um, I've got these awards for you. Please don't throw them at me. No, no. Thank, you. Thank you so much.